funny is ants crawling on my computer here. <laughs> it's a good thing. Eat them! <laughs> yeah. Later. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm going to... Um, there's been a very nice, uh, a lot of very nice uh, presentations today, and most of them has been from a very big perspective. You know, we talk about the world and changes that needs to happen, and changes that are happening, and changes that should happen. Uh, but I'm going to uh, mainly talk about what I do at my restaurant in the north of Sweden, and I'm going to start with uh, uh, telling you a little bit about how my year of vegetable looks like. And then I'm going to uh, continue with uh, just a little bit how, how we grow our vegetables and how we forage and so on. And then I'm going to spend most of the time uh, talking about how we store them for the winter. Because at Fabiken there is uh, basically six months of the year where there's nothing to harvest outside. There's no wild vegetables, there's nothing growing in the vegetable patches, there's just a lot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> So, <coughs> this, uh, I try to show a little bit what we have to work with on in different times of the year. Um, <coughs> you see uh, the blue line, which is uh, on the bottom, that's uh, forage stuff. And in May and June, where our vegetable year actually starts, for me, we work mainly uh, with um, wild plants, wild herbs and wild vegetables. And we do that because what we, what we harvested last year and stored during the winter is normally uh, running out then. And May and June is the months at, in Jämtland, the region where Fabiken is, when the forage stuff is at its peak. It's nice, young, tender, very good. Uh, then we take a little break in the uh, end of July, uh, end of June, or, sorry, shit. <coughs> end of June and uh, most of July from foraging, when uh, the plants grow up and become bitter and tough, we don't use them that much. And we concentrate on fresh produce from the vegetable gardens because they start to produce, they start to be able to harvest in, uh, in the early July. And then in August, we uh, continue with uh, more foraging. There's mushroom, there's berries, and a few other things that we concentrate on then. And then, <coughs> this time we are a bit later actually, uh, in, uh, in the middle of September, we start harvesting for the winter. We start preparing for the winter months. And we pick a lot of berries and mushrooms and wild things that we uh, prepare in various ways, but we, uh, the, the bulk, what we mainly use, is vegetables that we uh, grow in our vegetable patches and that is harvested before the winter comes and then prepared in a lot of different ways. And the green line on the top, that's <coughs> the time of the year that we have storage vegetables as the base of what we do. So you can see now, in the early September, it's like a magical moment when we have everything. That's a very nice time of the year. <laughs> um, wild vegetables and plants, as I said, it's very important for us because when we run out of stored stuff in, in May, there's basically nothing else to serve. And uh, this is um, our main foraging grounds. This is from uh, the top of a hill, and you can see there's a little valley towards the lake, which is very, very lush. And most of the uh, grounds at Fabiken is um, limestone. And it's, um, it's a huge variety of different herbs, which uh, uh, normally you don't find that high, high up. But we are also uh, very um, uh, affected by the Gulf Stream in a positive way. So we have a little bit nicer climate. It's more even than in, on, on that, uh, um, that far to the north normally. <coughs> this is just uh, a few of the most common um, wild, wild vegetables, herbs, and mushrooms and berries that we use. There is, uh, in total, there are several hundreds that we forage and use. This is the most common ones. The vegetable gardens is something I'm going to talk a little bit more on, and it's something I'm extremely proud of, because uh, at Fabiken our climate is uh, more or less sub-Arctic. It's very far in the north, and luckily we have the Gulf Stream to help us a little bit, but it's still, uh, the summer isn't that hot, it's um, quite short as well. And the one thing we have, though, is a lot of sun, which is a good thing. The days are very long. Here you can see the vegetable gardens in two different seasons. That one on the left is um, early spring, it's May, and the one on the right is early December. This is uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. It looks a bit different, and it's also a different angle, but this is uh, just besides the restaurant, and this is a, a view of the vegetable gardens with two people working it. This I also made myself. It's very bad. It's Google SketchUp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to show you a little bit and explain how we work with the garden because 
I'm, I'm pretty new to gardening. I've been, I, I made the first little vegetable patch about three years ago and I started to learn and started to investigate how you do it and I started talking to people. And then two years ago I employed a gardener who is very passionate, her name is Magdalena, and she's very passionate and very knowledgeable, very curious. Um, <clears throat> We, we choose um, a nice southern slope, and we have, uh, you see, at the top there is trees. It's trees uh, protecting the garden a little bit from uh, the western winds, which is the most common wind in Fabik, and there's always cold western wind from the sea blowing in. <laughs> um, <coughs> Our philosophy when it comes to gardening is, um, like, we want the best possible quality. We don't look that much in high yield and so on, so we choose varieties that we feel give Jacqueline. us the maximum taste okay. that we want. And we also try to uh, take very good care mm. of our soil. We don't want to deplete our soil, so we, uh, uh, we try a few different... Uh, yeah, as I said, this is still a learning process. So we try yeah. different techniques in different areas. I'm going to start to talk about the first one on the left, which you see there is marked four part crop rotation. And it's basically uh, three different kinds of crops from different families that take different nutrients out of the soil. And then the fourth field we grow yep. with um, something called green manure, and it's uh, plants that um, uh, bind nitrogen from the atmosphere, and then you just sort of turn them down into the soil in the autumn, and it, it gives back nitrogen to the soil. We also add little well-rotted cow shit and things like that. But there's no uh, chemical fertilizers, no herbicides or pesticides anywhere. Uh, the crop rotation is also important for us because we don't want to use, as I said, any herbicides or pesticides. And uh, it's good for, for disease control to move the plants all the time. Uh, yeah. This is a little photo from the first section of the four-part crop rotation. And <coughs> this is a pretty uh, like traditional garden. There's nothing really special about this. Um, this is early in the spring, and what you can see here, something we use a lot, is the little textile we put on top. It's very common. Most of you probably recognize it. And most of you probably know what it's for. It's to make the climate a little bit hotter and a little bit damper underneath the textile. But it also has an important function that we found is very, very important for us at least. And it's that if you keep this when the young, the, the, the seedling, the plant is young and vulnerable, you will um, uh, prevent it from getting different disease in the form of uh, insects because they can't really reach it. So. Uh, because the only insect control we have later on is that we have to take them away one by one. <laughs> and that's, that's tedious, that's not nice. <coughs> so, the other part, the most productive part of the vegetable patch is the middle part. It's the six part crop rotation. And it basically the same system, though there's two surfaces which is uh, planted with green manure. And, um, and it's also a little bit more technical kind of farming. It's raised beds, which means that you like, make a wooden thing that would like a huge box to, to make the bed where you uh, grow the vegetables a little bit higher up. And we also cover the soil with um, a dark, um, dark cloth, and every plant has a little hole to grow in. And this, uh, this has two benefits. First, the, the temperature in the soil gets a bit higher. And mainly, actually, for us, it saves a lot of time on um, taking away uh, unwanted, uh, unwanted plants, disturb disturbing your crop. And there is also drip irrigation in this part. It looks like this. This is uh, early June. And as I said, this is the most, most uh, productive part of our vegetable patch, and the one we actually started with, with the help from a, a university in Sweden to implement this technique. And and was very happy with it, but we are actually going to stop using it from next year. Because what we find is that when we analyze the soil in our vegetable patch, which we do every year, is that we do not succeed in replacing what we take away from the soil with this method. It's too productive for us. So we're going to either change it or stop using this exact method. In any way. Uh, last part is <coughs> the polytunnel, which is like a little, very cheap, very simple greenhouse. And there we grow our seedlings, which we then place out in the, in the vegetable garden. And on the far end, on the right side, it's a three-part crop rotation, um, which we try another technique, which looks like this, where we cover the soil, but not with, um, not with uh, the tissue, the, the black tissue, but with the grass clippings and things like that. And <coughs> As I said before, this is a learning process for us. We're trying different techniques and trying to see 
what uh, affects the soil in the best possible way and what gives us the maximum quality of vegetables. This is the herb gardens, which is uh, just besides the restaurant. The restaurant is the red building in the back. The herb gardens are there for um, partly because they're beautiful. We often serve the, often serve the aperitif before, the, before dinner there and so on, but they also give us all the herbs that we use in the summer and all the herbs that we dry and save for the winter. Storing vegetables is always about making a choice to kill the plant or not. This is something uh, I came up, I, I thought about myself a while ago while working with this and deciding how we're going to store uh, all the different vegetables we need for the winter because, and I think, I think this is a nice way of categorizing the ways that you can store vegetables because I'm going to tell you a bit, sorry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> some of the techniques, they kill the plant and they kill all the harmful bacteria too or it makes the environment difficult for them to live in and other ways of keeping vegetables for a long-term storage often includes a way of using built-in mechanism in the plants to make them uh, keep for a long time. And I'm going to uh, talk a lot now, the, 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 the 20 minutes I have left, about all those different techniques that we're going to use. But one thing that is important to remember when, uh, when storing vegetables and when preparing vegetables is uh, that they are never better than when, that they were actually in the beginning. The storage is not a way to make the vegetable better. It just makes it different. And there is uh, non no technique which is better than any other technique. You know, the non-killing techniques are not better than the killing techniques. They're just different from each other. And they're good for different things. And different is good often, actually. Yeah, happy chef. This is, I start with this one because this is not actually a technique for storing vegetables. This is uh, just me <coughs> last year being very lazy and not harvesting everything in time and the winter came and um, I actually found out that um, a lot of things you can harvest even if they are still covered with snow and still standing in the vegetable gardens and I knew this uh, could be applied on, on a few different plants but uh, I found out it's possible with many more than I thought actually. Uh, the one that we use this most with is broccoli because we harvest the first, you know, the first big, nice broccoli flower. We harvest that one, and then afterwards we have a secondary harvest of normally three small broccoli flowers sprouting out in edges, and we take those. And in the end, we just leave the plant. We leave the plant with all the leaves still attached, and then we go out there in uh, in December or even later, and we harvest those those leaves. For example, you see that dish, a little goat dish. And that's a broccoli leaf. That's that photo is taken in December, and. <coughs> I don't have like, the, the scientific explanation to why this works, but uh, it does. And the, the plant is uh, basically, you can't tell the difference between that and a fresh broccoli leaf. It also works very good with the kale, for example, and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and, and things like that. This is uh, clamping is one of the um, oldest techniques for keeping, um, uh, especially root vegetables. And it's a good technique to use if you don't have the time or the to build your own root cellar or the money or the place to, use to, to put it. And it's uh, basically you need um, very ripe, very ripe um, uh, root vegetables. Root, this is, oh yeah, this is uh, one of those techniques that uses a function which is built into the actual plant. And <clears throat> what you need is a very ripe root vegetable, as I said. And that root vegetable, it needs to be uh, set to hibernate. It needs to have already felt that the autumn is coming and prepared itself for uh, you know, a, very, a time of very, very little growth and just waiting for the spring. So you harvest, um, you harvest your root vegetables and uh, this has to be done in a, in a pretty cold weather because otherwise they don't realize it's actually autumn and they start growing inside the clamp later. You, uh, <coughs> you uh, make a few, uh, like two drainage trenches, one on each side and on a little mound between them you uh, place a layer of straw. And how thick that layer needs to be, it depends on the climate where you are and how humid it is and a lot of things. You have to just try yourselves and find a good yeah. thickness. Yeah. You place the vegetables on top and it shouldn't be too small. You can't do like a little very narrow thing like this, you know. You have to be, yeah, like almost one meter of vegetables in order for this to work really, really well. You cover them with straw and then you add more soil on top. And you also make a little, uh, like a little ventilation chimney somewhere in the, in the clamp to, Just go over there, to yeah. get excess moist out. And <coughs> uh, 
storing vegetables like this, it, uh, it keeps uh, most root vegetables. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> it keeps most root vegetables really fine until uh, in, until spring, actually. So they can be kept for like six months. And what can be dangerous with this is that you put everything together, and if they start going bad, the process can spread from one vegetable to the other, another, and you, you don't, you're not, you know, since you can't just open up the clamp and just take out one, one vegetable and then close it again, it can be difficult to, um, uh, to know if in, in one end you have a bunch of rotten vegetables destroying the others if you're in the wrong end, so harvesting them. Uh, the root cellar. This is sort of a, a more modern way of using the same function as the clamp. Um, what's important with the root cellar is that it's uh, very well ventilated and that it's uh, stable in temperature over the year. Storing root vegetables in a cellar, we do so that we uh, use big crates of sand and then we, uh, we, we put um, all the vegetables in there and we bury them in sand. And the sand helps to control and to even out differences in humidity and temperature over the year. Um, we can keep them this for a very, like this for a very long time. And of course, they change there. They, they, there will be a change in the vegetable. And for the first months, it, it will look practically the same. But then it starts to shrivel a little bit. And often in the spring, uh, especially with, for example, carrot and parsnip, carrot, parsnip, and beets, they will sense that it's arriving, and they will start to sprout. And that usually marks the end of the storage period for those vegetables. So you just have to, when that happens, you just have to uh, uh, take them out of the sand and be sure to use the little sprouts because those are very good. They are like the essence of a vegetable. And use the rest as well, of course. This has been standing in a, in a storage place in the farm, in the estate. There's, there's a lot of other people like besides the restaurant staff working at Fabic, and this is how much the, the other people respect my equipment. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, I read a study from uh, the Swedish Agricultural um, University, SLU, a while ago, about um, how to store uh, vegetables, and especially leeks. And apparently leeks, if you, if you put them uh, in a low temperature and uh, the proper amount of air humidity, they can keep for a very long time. And this is uh, manifested by the fact that you can harvest your leeks and put them in a piece of soil just outside of your door, and you can keep them there all through winter, even if it's below zero and so on, it doesn't matter. Uh, this, is though, this, though, is very difficult at Fabricant because there's so much snow, so you can't really get down to them. So we built this. We bought an ordinary household freezer. We uh, tinkered it with, with the thermostat, so it keeps uh, exactly one degree below zero. We fill it with sand in the bottom, and then we just harvest the leaks in early, late September or early October, and we stick them down the sand. And <coughs> Uh, we also moisten the sand a little bit because it's, it, the humidity should be between 90 and 95 percent. And this way, the study said that you can keep them in about 90 days, but we've been trying and, and, and keeps fine for around 120 days. And if you, in the spring, if you put them out, outside again in your vegetable patch, they just continue growing. <laughs> it's very fun, actually. Uh, yeah, drying of onions and garlic. <clears throat> um, in the autumn, we harvest our onions and garlics, and we just leave them lying outside, as on the, on, the, on the picture to the left, until all the leaves have become brown and dead. And then we just take them inside. We store them uh, in a dry and room temperature space, and dark. They keep for a very long time, all winter. Pasteurizing, this is uh, a technique that kills the, the plant. Uh, in that can, there is tomatoes. Those were uh, put in a very light brine in 2009 and then uh, kept at uh, 85 degrees in a steam oven for uh, about 10 minutes. And they keep very well that tight. Uh, this is a technique that most people use at home like 50 or 60 years ago. It was very, very common, but no one, nobody does it almost today. And <coughs> it's a technique that you have to be a bit careful with because since you uh, kill most of the normal bacteria and certainly all the lactic acidic bacteria, uh, there is a danger if you're not very meticulous with the hygiene and things that you can have uh, Clostridium botulinum, which is uh, not very good. It's a bacteria that can grow and can kill people. <coughs> Pickling in vinegar. Um, in Scandinavia, it's something that we use a lot for herring and vegetables and a lot of different stuff. It's uh, a good technique for condiments, I find. And it preserves the plant material 
by mainly by changing the pH level to uh, to somewhere where uh, most uh, microorganisms can't actually breed or grow. Pickling by lactobacillus fermentation. It's uh, <coughs> a technique that uses, uh, it's, uh, it's basically the most important part of this is the same as pickling in vinegar. It's the change of pH level to a level that most bacteria and other microorganisms don't like. But this is uh, uh, different in the, in, in the way that normally you just take the plant, in this case a cucumber, and you put it uh, in a brine between one and a half and two percent of salt. And you let the, the um, lactic acidic bacteria present on the skin of the vegetable grow and produce lactic acid, which preserves the, 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 the plant. Um, <clears throat> this is not possible to do with, uh, with uh, vegetables that have been uh, farmed with uh, herbicides and pesticides, for example, because the levels of lactobacillus on them are far too low, so it doesn't really work very well. Um, with this, you also have to be very careful with the hygiene because, uh, and also with, you have to be very careful with following the process uh, and getting the fermentation started very quickly because if it takes too long a time or if the hygiene has been poor, it's, uh, it's also a risk of uh, Clostridium botulinum in this. Uh, drying herbs and mushrooms. Uh, we dry a lot of herbs. Um, every herb we serve in the winter is either dried or in the form of herb salt. And it's actually uh, very, very simple. You, uh, uh, Pick the herb at the peak of its maturity on a day when uh, you can really feel and smell when you touch it, you <coughs> smell the, the, yeah, the aromas. Yeah. Um, you harvest it and you, uh, you uh, place it um, in a good place to dry. And for me, it's um, in, in the washroom, the room where we do the laundry actually. And we have this uh, magnificent little machine here, which is a dehumidifier. And that's the industrial one. It can. Uh, uh, take away about 20 liters of water every hour from a closed space. So we can dry, um, like for example, if we take, we make 10 hotel trays with herbs and we put them, we spread them out in the room, we can dry them in, in, in about three hours. And what we achieve by this very quick drying is a uh, nice color and also nice preservation. And the most important is nice preservation of the, the aromas because what you don't want to do when um, uh, drying herbs is to heat them up, because you lose the most fragile and volatile aromas. Um, you can also use antibacterial properties in, uh, which are naturally present in, present in plants. These are lingonberries, and lingonberries are very high in uh, benzoic acid, naturally, and benzoic acid is added to a lot of um, processed food as a preservative. Basically, you take the lingonberries, you just put them in jars, and uh, you top off the jars with water, and then you just leave them, and they will keep forever. You don't have to heat it or add sugar or anything, they will keep for years. And in, in the can, you will have a, uh, a very, very slow enzymatic fermentation. So you will have, it, it won't be yeast cells, because they don't like it there, but there will be an enzymatic fermentation, and you will have like a little bit of alcohol, around 0.7% of alcohol. So you can feel it, uh, it's like yogurt when you put it on the tongue. Uh, leguminous plants. This is something that we use in all stages of the plant's life, from the first little sprouts to the seedling, which we harvest and use in salads, uh, to the fresh peas, which we harvest right now. They're very, very good right now, and beans too. And then finally to dried and threshed seeds that we, um, that we uh, prepare and use in the winter months. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you.